This conference will now be recorded. This conference is now being recorded. Okay. Um, I, I love these meetings. It's the highlight of my week. And uh, this week is gonna be entertaining for me because Ron Leopold, MD, is our speaker. And I've known him now for 30 years. And Ron and I went to Wharton together. We were in the Wharton Follies together. And uh, when I was a second, when we were second years, he was the head writer for the Follies. And for all but the Shakespeare skit, wrote every funny thing I uttered that year. Now, they were amusing on the page. It really came down to the delivery. Um, but um, once I got past his typos, the people found it hilarious. I think the term I'm looking for is, he made me what I am today. <laughs> Here's Ron. <clears throat> Hi guys. Ron, what are you gonna to talk to us about today? Okay, so um, I do have a deck that um, I will use if only just, um, if I were listening to what I had to say, I would kind of want to uh, focus on things. Can I give Joe, you the screen straight that? away? No, no, let me, let, let me, uh, is it is it deck or video or no, is it side by No, you get both. Okay. This is full service. This isn't some kind of. Right, hold on. Let, let me just give an intro and then we'll go from there. Okay. I'm not sure how relevant what I'm going to talk about is for uh, is to each of you. Um, uh, but the topic is uh, let, let let me pitch the topic and then maybe get a little feedback from uh, anybody that wants to pipe up. Um, I've been doing a lot of work with new medical technologies, digital health, digital medicine, et cetera, that are interested in taking their product or service and uh, marketing it to the self-insured uh, uh, employer marketplace. So in other words, um, if we step back and we think about who pays for medical, and everything I'm saying, unfortunately, is gonna be US-based, but who pays for medical, um, you know, we have commercial, individual, Medicare, Medicaid as, as four pieces of the pie. The largest is commercial, and that's largely employer-sponsored health plans. And so um, companies, very small ones, medium and large companies, uh, make buying decisions on behalf of their employees. Why do employers uh, offer health benefits and why might they go above and beyond just what they're getting from their um, uh, from their uh, um, uh, their, their uh, carriers, their insurance carriers? Um, because offering employee benefits um, is a way of attracting employees, retaining uh, employees, and driving productivity and performance. So. There are many services, and I'm not sure how many in the medical device space, but we can explore that, that are interested, well, you know, if I can't sell my product to the entire commercial space, there may be particular employers that are interested uh, in it. And so what I thought I'd do today, if it makes sense, is kind of give you a little bit of a, 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 of a framework for how you might approach that marketplace. Let me stop and get a sense from each of you how relevant what I just said is to your world. Let me uh, answer on behalf of the group. Everything you said is completely irrelevant to us, but we don't know shit about it and we okay. want to. And this video will be made available to a much larger audience. And uh, frankly, you're the only one in my network who can speak intelligently on this topic. And there's okay. plenty of stuff happening with digital health. I just texted my reimbursement guy. I said you should be on this call. Uh, so there will be uh, life after our next hour. I'm interested. And these gentlemen were warned what we would talk about. So, mm -hmm. Are there any other angles or adjacencies that you think uh, might be relevant for me to address? Men, have at it, Ron. Okay. You know, once we, just a, just a concept, I guess, of you know, pitching your device to different segments of the uh, sort of the four different um, 
segments you talked about, that's, I, I guess, kind of an, uh, an interesting concept for me that I'm not very familiar with. So, so yeah, I definitely come at it with absolutely no knowledge and, and uh, would certainly be interested just in, in some more background on that as well. Okay, I'm giving you access to the screen. Yeah, let me, uh, uh, sorry, um, that's helpful, thanks. Um, open system preferences. Joe, what, uh, what do I do to get, to, to get that up? Um, so there should be uh, in your toolbar a little orange button down at the bottom saying go to meeting. And if you click on that, it will likely show you that you have the been given a chance to share your screen. Yeah, I should have tested this. This guy actually wrote a book on the internet back in the 90s and I was like, wow, dude. And now he can't even figure out how to use his phone. I don't know what happened to you, man. All right. Joe, do you want to help me uh, get, the, get the PowerPoint up? Yes, let's see what I can do. I'm gonna take the screen. You can see my screen now. I'm going to change presenter to you. So if you can see my screen, and, and do you see down here on my screen, this little orange button? Down here, you see my cursor in the toolbar? I'm at the bottom, oh. yeah. yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do you have one like that? Yeah. Go click on that. Right. Right now. And it should say, Ron Leopold is the new presenter. Would like to capture this computer screen. Deny open system preferences. Joe, I think it's different on our end. I, to, to share the screen, you go into the, the chat, above the chat box, there's mm -hmm. a tab that says screen. And then you click on the tab, and then right below that, it says share my screen. No. Ron, do you, You're talking to me or to Joe? I'm talking, Ron, if you go to your no, chat. No, Ron is trying to explain to you what he believes is your user experience versus mine as the guy with the controls. Go ahead, guys, and I'm sorry about this. That's uh, okay. okay. Um, I should have done this ahead of time with you. My apologies. Okay. Uh, why don't you take a, um, I'll tell you what, why don't you slack your presentation to me and I'll show it just to kind of keep things moving along. Well, I think and I have to share my screen now. Let's see. Hooray, Ronald. <laughs> so um, let me pull this up. Let me see if you're able to. We're here. We're seeing it. He can sit. See, typing isn't his thing. Say it again. But just kind of the first word there. I had a typo there. It was like the second word I read. But, but, but your knowledge transcends correct spelling. We're eager to hear what you have to say. Um, medical so, so first and foremost, uh, medical devices typically do not sell directly to this marketplace. Uh, what does sell would be a uh, um, telemedicine service. So we have a service which is a combination of um, software uh, and um, uh, software and a network of providers that we believe uh, we can deliver to your covered population above and beyond uh, just what they get from their employer. Um, it might be a, a type of genetic testing uh, where um, we can help folks who are either predisposed to certain conditions or genetically test them for how they respond uh, to pharmaceuticals and uh, deliver that in a cost-effective way. So what employers typically are looking for, uh, um, SIE, self-insured employers, is, is there a way that if I were to work with you, uh, you could reduce my medical costs? Um, and, and that largely, uh, that second um, uh, bullet point, medical cost reduction through marketplace innovation. So if you had a way of offsetting what I'm spending on specialty medicines, uh, what I'm spending uh, for cardiac surgery, uh, what I'm spending uh, for um, um, hospital care um, for cancer, uh, what I'm spending for chemotherapeutic, that would be great. Now the challenge is, and where you might see a, um, 
a connection is that um, employers will, what employers have paid for is what they are insured for. And so more often than not, somebody from a therapeutic or device standpoint might seek to speak to employers, but actually they really should be talking to the healthcare carriers. And I will spend a little bit of time from my perspective in terms of how does a healthcare carrier, how does an insurance company, a medical insurance company decide whether or not to cover a device, a procedure or a process? Does that make sense? Very much. And uh, just, I, I think it'll be easy for us to relate to, I'll just go with the easy one, Fitbit, and say, I believe the concept here is if there's anything that I can measure, metrics uh, that could indicate um, cause for concern that cuts you off at the pass before it gets into a, a a worse disease state, that's the concept. If you have a, a technology that allows people to self-monitor, remote patient exactly. monitoring, basically. Exactly, but if, exactly. But if it's not that, is there anything outside of the remote patient monitoring space where what you're talking about makes sense and is applicable? Because I can't if think. Had, so a couple of things come to mind. Um, if you have uh, a diagnostic capability that, um, it, you know, let's say it's expensive, so it's not covered, but if it's you, the sweet spot is always, this works, but it's so expensive that the economies of scale to use this either as a general screening or as a screening for a, a disease state that's too broad when there are other alternatives that are just as good or almost as good from a cost benefit analysis, then no, it's not covered. If you could make the case that we could um, work with you to screen for, um, uh, uh, by selecting the right covered members, and we're talking about employees, spouses, and dependents, to, to, let's say we had um, a, a, a cardiac screening test that um, really um, was, uh, uh, and, and this, could be, this could be radiographic, this could be a blood test, this could be genetic, um, but that, that really made it, that, that could really uh, um, uh, pinpoint uh, the, uh, a very high risk of a certain cardiac event. Um, but it costs uh, $15,000, um, an employer or an insurance company is not going to want to spend $15,000 to um, to test 5% of a population. But if you could work with the insurance company and or not work with the insurance company, but limit you're testing to the subset of the subset that it really makes sense for, but not 5%, but let's say 0.1%, and you might have something. Does that make sense? It does. I, I'm thinking of another example. A friend created a smoking cessation device. I'm thinking that that could potentially play in somehow. So smoking cessation, absolutely, Joe, uh, and that is in um, improved member engagement uh, in health and wellness. Uh, so um, the whole wellness sector um, has, uh, for the last decade, been um, an area where larger employers and more sophisticated medium and smaller employers have invested in programs and approaches above and beyond just what they're getting from their health carrier. So their health carrier, Cigna, Aetna, uh, Blues Plan, Anthem, Kaiser, United Health, might have a wellness program, but another company might, say, might reach them and say, we have a wellness program um, that is, um, you know, very effective and can be customized to your population and goes significantly beyond just what you would get from Aetna or Cigna, employers take that. 
And employers may also say we had a wellness program, but we know that smoking is so prevalent in our population. And when we look at our medical and pharmacy claims data, we know that smoking related disorders and costs are very high. Um, and if you have a better mousetrap, and we'll talk a little bit about the credentialing of it, we're interested in that. So in other words, so what, you know, you talked about metrics, Joe, um, you know, we're looking at um, taking your device, taking your approach, taking your solution, and can you reduce my cost per member, cost per member with a particular condition? Um, can you reduce overall utilization trends? Uh, can you target specific acute and or chronic conditions? Um, can you reduce gaps in care? Gaps in care is a term that describes steps that we would expect to see based on a person's age and gender and steps that we would expect to see based, so in other words, people over 50 getting colonoscopies would be a gap in care. Or uh, people with a condition getting certain services. People with diabetes getting tested for HbA1c. Um, uh, and or if you could reduce uh, uh, risks for future pharmacy uh, and, and, and or medical spends in, in, in their plans. Clear so far? Kind of? Enough. I, I don't want to monopolize. I know I, I could just carry on with a string, but you have some slides and I imagine you have, um, or you will address many of the questions I have. Okay, so let me keep going. I, I, you know, I, I want to keep this uh, certainly uh, no longer than the first half hour, but I think the slides will, will set things up uh, uh, nicely. Um, so, you know, how will your health product uh, disrupt the status quo? So, some questions that, when I was doing consulting on behalf of uh, employers, what are you offering? What's the upside of your technology? Are there potential downsides? Um, do the benefits outweigh the costs? Is it medically necessary? Is it advisable? Has it been approved? What are the um, uh, what are the alternatives? What are the costs? And what are the costs of the alternatives? What population is it intended for? How will it be implemented? And what are the costs associated with implementation? And by the way, um, when you're looking at this uh, uh, this audience. Half the battle is uh, to be um, organized, you know, you're not just a, 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 you know, if you have a blood test, it's not just having the technology for the blood test, but it's also, and this is where I think it might go outside of the usual sphere of the folks uh, on this call today, but also do I have an approach? Can I support a user experience that, uh, won't be disruptive, that will be easy, that um, will be high service, that will be uh, reproducible. Um, what are the ethical and legal ramifications, certainly, and what's the return on investment, ROI, or the value on investment? And can you prove it? So what I mean by value is it can be cost, but it can also be if you use this service, it will reduce employee absence. Uh, as, as another way, or if you use this service, um, uh, employees will be happier and therefore more grateful to their employer and more engaged uh, in their um, and more engaged uh, uh, in their work. And are there other employers doing this? That that's uh, especially if you're coming at it from a uh, from a, a disruptive perspective. Um, most employers don't want to be first, but if you have uh, uh, proof with other uh, uh, employers uh, doing it, uh, uh, th that's useful. And um, to that end, can you do what you say you'll do? Uh, do you have that proven uh, track record? And I made the point with the, with the service. So an example that I'm going to give you uh, is considerations for a vendor offering um, genetic testing to, uh, to self-insured employers. So Joe, you said you had somebody with a smoking cessation, let's say uh, uh, somebody uh, on this call or one of your members had um, a genetic test that could test for likelihood of um, a sudden cardiac event in the next six months. 
uh, based on your genetics. Uh, th that's probably, uh, let, let's pick something different. Likelihood for developing um, rheumatoid arthritis uh, in the next five to 10 years, um, um, uh, which uh, could, uh, uh, if treated properly now, could prevent the cost of expensive medicines like Humira. So, uh, you know, the overall value proposition, what's being tested, why is it important, what labs are you using, how much does it cost, who pays those costs, um, does the insurance company pay for it, and if they don't, why not? Um, employees want to know, um, is it confidential, uh, how's the testing administered, do I have to go someplace, does somebody come to me, is it uh, just a, a, a swab at the side, side of the cheek or a saliva sample? Uh, are treating physicians uh, uh, going to help me interpret the, the, the test or are other credential professionals? Um, will my doctor, does my doctor have to be involved? And also, will my doctor be involved? And um, uh, um, uh, for genetic testing, will recipients receive updates as new diagnostics become available? So um, if, uh, uh, you know, we could test for rheumatoid arthritis and give you, a, you know, whether or not you have high, medium, and low uh, chances, but later on, uh, the different, uh, 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 the different uh, varieties of genetic testing could better map to an even more specific uh, risk stratification, you know, would I be notified? And then for employers, will I get calls from unhappy employees? Will I see my return on investment? Are you willing, uh, any performance guarantees? Are you willing to put your money where your mouth is? What uh, process quality controls do you have? Um, will, the, will we get reporting in aggregate? And can you provide references? I have some, some thoughts. Uh, first, in both the chat window on GoToMeeting and Ron in your Slack, I sent you a link. Uh, this is uh, my friend Brandon's company called Tomorrow Health, the number two and Morrow, uh, if you want to take a look at it. And I'd be curious on your initial take if this kind of fits the mold you're discussing. Um, while you're doing that, I'm curious to know how, how aware are self-insured employers aware of this category? Because my ignorance, and I really admit I know nothing about this, um, when you're choosing a health plan for your company, you probably choose something that has lots of coverages, like a Cigna and Aetna that has a whole network of things. What you're describing seems very piecemeal, and I would think, as the human resource benefit person at a company, I would want the Cygnas and the Aetnas to deal with integrating this into their package. I don't want to have to deal with that and then start doing these add-ons that you present. You're exactly right. So um, uh, wherever possible, um, uh, because um, uh, uh, employers in this category and their employees don't like uh, vendor overload, uh, Any time that solutions can be aggregated, the better. So, uh, if uh, you know, I'm I'm trying to think through what your viewership and membership uh, might think. But typically, you know, if it's a big category that requires a specific um, solution, low back cancer treatment. Um, uh, uh, specialty medicines, um, smoking cessation, sometimes employers, uh, 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 let's see, um, uh, infertility benefits, um, um, disease management for, um, uh, uh, for diabetes. These are ones where carve-out solutions are specific to what I just said. The example that you set with Tomorrow Health is one, uh, this is a little more global and it is uh, and looks like an awful lot of uh, the wellness solutions that employers have been purchasing. And this is one that, um, uh, um, uh, this is one that offers a set of solutions that are fairly, um, uh, fairly similar to what uh, we see uh, in the marketplace today. Did I answer your question, Joe? Okay. Um, 
The only other thing I wanted to get to, and I'd rather get to a discussion, is would it be helpful to go over how insurance comp uh, carriers determine medical necessity? I would be interested, yes. Okay. Um, basically, insurance carriers determine what they're going to cover based on medical necessity. Now, as you'll see shortly, something could be, um, uh, can, can be medically legitimate or work medically effective, but medical necessity is the process for determining benefits covered. Will your plan, will your insurance company um, and or provider payment for services, tests or procedures that are medically appropriate and cost effective? And they do this by maintaining a clinical policy unit if it's a larger insurance carrier, they have their own. Uh, they also sometimes work with third-party vendors that develop some of this. So if your game is cardiac treatment, if your game is um, um, uh, uh, surgical equipment for back surgery, if your game is uh, dialysis, um, you know, wh whatever that is, um, and, and, and I'll give you some illustrations, but, uh, but carriers maintain you know, thousands of, uh, you know, of multi-page documents that describe whether something is covered and when something is covered. And the criteria they use to determine clinical policies is this treatment um, uh, in accordance with generally accepted standards of medical practice, is it indeed clinically appropriate and effective? Uh, is it for something more than just convenience? Uh, example there is a person with um, uh, two broken legs, uh, they're covered for a wheelchair. Would an electric wheelchair be better? Absolutely, but it costs four times as much and that additional cost would be for convenience, so not necessarily covered. The difference between a rich plan and a poor plan, if you will, so in other words, what your deductible, what your premium is, or what your copay is, um, uh, might be that the very skimpy plan, the bronze plan, doesn't pay for an electric wheelchair, but a very rich plan, the gold or platinum, does. Is it not more costly than an equivalent alter alternative service, or uh, what are the costs of alternative services? Is it better the same as those alternative services? Is the thing that's better just convenience? Uh, is it endorsed or recommended by national medical societies and associations? Uh, uh, has it been FDA uh, approval? And very important, one of the key takeaways, I would say, is um, FDA approval where it is applicable is always necessary, meaning that if the category of your medical device does have to get FDA approval, that's step one. But FDA approval in of itself is not sufficient to meet coverage criteria. And then likewise, what Medicare pays for it, carriers follow Medicare policy uh, uh, closely, but are not obligated, um, are not obligated to, um, uh, uh, to match what Medicare does or doesn't spend. I'm going to pause here, but here are um, some of the, um, uh, 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 in, in a 12-month period, United Healthcare added uh, close to 200 um, uh, policies uh, to um, uh, clinical policies to their um, library of about 2,000. And just to give you a sense of the, 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 the scope and breadth and specificity of it, uh, can you guys read this okay? No. I'm not sure how large that or small the uh, slide is. Very small. Uh, on the bottom right of your PowerPoint, there's something that looks like a a screen, like a. If you can click on that, and it should at least take up your whole screen. There we go. Is that better? Probably better, but a little. Go ahead. And this is really just intended as a um, as an illustration. 
I don't think I have a whole lot more on this. You know, here are some of the, um, you know, an anthem medical po uh, policy on uh, axial lumbar inner body fusion, um, Aetna on proton beam therapy, Cigna on dermabrasion and chemical fuels, and United Healthcare on, on surgery for glaucoma. Uh, and then I think my last slide, yeah, is, um, um, uh, you know, these are some of the um, areas where if a doctor orders something uh, or if a provider orders a service, these are the services that typically have to go through a review process, a pre-authorization or pre-approval process before, um, uh, uh, before getting approved. I'll, uh, I'll take out the screen now because I don't think you yeah. need it anymore. That's it. And uh, we. So I, you know, I wanted to give you. I wanted to give you a sense of uh, that as background. Let me answer. You know, questions or whatnot. Whether you know, I, Joe, all the questions you've asked have been. You know, right in there. Um, I try to. I try to skew my comments to what I thought the collective. Uh, Fair interest well, I, I anticipate that um, those who may choose to come back and watch this later. Uh, I think the most relevant question for my audience would be, okay, so I created digital technology. I believe it can do the things that you shared on slide one, gaps and behavior modification and things like that. How do I go about getting adoption? Do I hire someone like you to go door to door, company to company, or do I go, should I spend my effort asking Cigna to, you know, include my concept in their coverage? Um, let's assume that I'm a startup, most likely. Okay. Here's my big idea. And um, yeah, John puts on his camera for this part. That makes sense. Hey, John. Um, and I don't have uh, unlimited resources. I can either go chase the Cygnus or I start making individual phone calls. What, what have you seen work, Ron? Maybe you can give an example. You know, a lot of it, Joe, depends on what, um, what your product is. Uh, the first question is, is what I have something that might have value for an employer marketplace? So, uh, you know, I remember I was on the call two or three weeks ago, uh, two or three calls ago uh, where uh, uh, the presenter, she was talking about packaging of stents. Now the packaging is part of the product. Now, as I listened to her, none of, if you were making a better stent, uh, a better surgical guide, none of that would go directly to the employer. That would be an example of, you know, what I want to do is I want to sell directly to providers, to hospitals, and I want to influence uh, the orthopedic surgeon and the neurosurgeons that utilize that. So I think the first question is, is this a realm where it makes sense? So if you're dealing with a, a, a specific small piece of surgery or treatment, et cetera, probably not. If, on the other hand, you're talking about more of a population approach, if you're talking about a little bit more of a holistic solution for a subset of a population that exists in a working family um, uh, um, uh, demographic, um, absolutely. So if I have, if I have a, a, um, a new way of packaging dialysis uh, 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 fluid, um, you wouldn't go to the employer. If you were part of whatever kind of business apparatus that had a better dialysis solution, you would go to the employer. So question one, is the employer marketplace, given the scope of what my product is, an appropriate place to go? And if you were not dialysis um, uh, uh, tubing uh, uh, or dialysis, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a new container, but you were, a, 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 a dialysis solution, how would you go to market? 
And there, I think it is, um, uh, uh, would the employer market make sense? The answer is probably because dialysis happens in a very small number of people, obviously, but represents a huge cost. And so um, what you would need to research is what do employers spend on uh, overall renal care? What do they spend on dialysis? What are they spending? Uh, what is the rate of dialysis? And then um, how is dialysis currently delivered? Is it currently delivered outpatient, inpatient? Um, are there companies like DaVita uh, that are a specialty network of dialysis? Do I have a better approach based on what they're currently doing? And if you feel like you do, then the answer is finding people that know the market because the marketplace is a rather small community um, and uh, the players know one another and know what the um, existing resources might be. By that, are you saying that that, that commun community includes your former employer and its competitors? So the community would include employers, but specifically benefits and to a lesser degree, HR people within a, 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 an employer. It includes insurance companies. It includes brokers and consultants. And it includes other third-party vendors like wellness programs like the tomorrowinc.com uh, that you showed me. It might be a diabetes specialty management uh, or condition management program. It might be DaVita, a dialysis, a network of dialysis centers and coordination and case management. Um, it might be um, a telemedicine company that sells its services both to insurance carriers, to your point, to embed in insurance, uh, uh, th their product, as well as direct to employers where we're going to use this telemedicine regardless of what my, my uh, the carrier uh, offers as, as, a, uh, as a solution uh, in that area. I know you won't be on the market long, but... Uh... You think you'll be available to take calls if folks follow up from this and say, sure. yeah. well, absolutely. Any yeah, of you have, yeah. yeah this is Glenn. Can I uh, complicate things? I'm, I'm pretty good at doing that. Uh, All right. Well, first, introduce the... yourself because yeah. Ron's not familiar with your background. Okay, great. Uh, Glenn Pearson, I'm principal of uh, Pearson Health Tech Insights. And what I do is I help hospital, or excuse me, developers, uh, entrepreneurs, technology folks with their strategies for selling into the healthcare world. I spent uh, 30 plus years on the hospital side. I was executive vice president of Georgia Hospital Association for 19 years. So I'm speaking from the provider perspective. And, you know, I love I love what I'm hearing. So I'm not arguing with anything you're saying. Uh, there's just the, I just wanted to point out that uh, medical necessity and pre-authorization are kind of dirty words within the hospital community because it's perceived often as a mechanism to deny payments and, um, you know, kind of moving thresholds. And, um, you know, the, last week you approved patient with these characteristics, this week you're not. Uh, different payers have different levels of uh, different thresholds for acceptability. And, you know, if you look at it from the frontline person within the healthcare delivery site, their job is to fit, to sort out, well, okay, is this patient has this insurance, you know, what are their standards and what is someone else going to do? So it's a, it's kind of a nightmare to manage, even though there are definitions there, but um, and it's an unavoidable reality of the way things are. But um, let me just give a couple of anecdotes here or just one or two but this is not quite the same thing as pre-authorization but here in georgia about uh 15 years ago maybe they the uh, medicaid program went to managed care uh providers um and there's a big deal over what was being billed as inappropriate use of the er by medicaid patients and essentially what the some of the managed care plans did was decide that unless a patient met certain medical necessity criteria, 
the provide the hospital get 50 bucks for an ER visit. Well, you know, the basic problem with that is that first of all, the hospital has no control over who walks in the ER. But secondly, some of the denials, uh, when I was at Georgia Hospital Association, we were getting all kinds of complaints from our providers uh, about cases that people would have thought were clearly emergency cases that were considered, no, they're not really emergency, they're $50 cases. So just a couple of examples, there's one, uh, like I think a one-year-old who had been to the pediatrician's office early in the day with high fever, was seen by the pediatrician who sent the mom and baby home and said, well, you know, it seems to be stable, but if the fever spikes later, get care immediately. So the fever went up to, you know, 100, 304. So of course the mom goes in the ER and then the managed care company said, well, that's not a medic, that, that shouldn't have been an ER visit. Well, there was essentially extended doctor's orders. There's another case where a pregnant woman was having vaginal bleeding. So she went into the ER and was told that, that she shouldn't have gone, that it was not medical necessity. So none of that is directly relevant to what you're talking about, but I just wanted to point out the fact that as soon as you start talking in those terms, there's kind of a barrier <laughs> that anybody on the provider side is going to have, and then add to that the confusion over multiple standards from multiple insurance companies and, and a perception, I'm not saying this is true, but a perception that sometimes payers are playing games uh, to avoid paying uh, by using metal, medical necessity pre-authorization as a as a as a ploy. Let, let, uh, uh, let me let, let's take um, situation that you described and look at it from four different stakeholders. Okay. Patient, the provider, and the doctor. Okay. The insurance company, and then the employer. Uh, who, who I, I, I'm advocating um, on behalf. When I say that, my traditional role has been to advocate on behalf. Right. So what is the, so uh, and you have mother with a sick baby that goes to the ER. The ER says, your insurance says that I have to call 1-800, ask the doctor first before we can approve you for treatment, okay? So the lady with the baby, who's covered by the insurance company because she works for the company, has gone to the, the provider, the ER. She wants her kid taken care of. Now, if she knows that it will cost her personally $10 to go up the street to an urge center or $500 of her own money at that point, and she mm -hmm. probably doesn't know that, but mm -hmm. maybe we'll get to know that. She herself may make the decision. Well, I I don't have five hundred, and I, you know I don't think that. No, I guess I'm going to take my baby up to ten dollars. If on the other hand she fervent, you know, let's imagine somebody that's you know not of a particular means. She fervently believes my baby's about. I know something's sure. wrong. Yeah. I don't care what it yeah. costs. Right. That's a dynamic right there. The provider, ER, bring them in. ER will want to see the patient. ERs um, drive revenue. So ERs um, won't say, you know, the ERs may have incentives or they may have an urge center and say, if you'd like, you can go to the urge center. But, you know, ERs in certain parts of the country advertise on, on highway billboards what their waiting yeah. times are. Yeah, yeah. So let's remember that providers are revenue maximizers, and uh, generally will err on the side of, well, yeah, bring them in, let's take a look, uh, et cetera. I'm not saying they're doing harm, but I am saying they're not watching the purse strings at all. Employers want this young lady uh, uh, with the baby to get good care. She wants the service to be as good as possible. Um, the employer doesn't have any control of what's going to happen at that hospital, but the employer does look to the insurance company to make sure that that process is as seamless and easy as possible. The provider is dealing with our insurance company and five dozen other ones, some of which are terrible, some of which are wonderful and everything in between. Yeah. I, as the employer, have entrusted the insurance company to provide good service, to give me a plan where that 
$10 at the Urgent Center and $500 here makes sense, mm -hmm. and to have the right criteria. I will tell you more often than not, that lady uh, will say, I'm gonna spend the $10 to go to the Urgent Center, and really they didn't need the emergency room. Right. Um, and I'm looking to the insurance company to help me navigate that. In that whole scenario, does it ever happen that the lady decides to go to the urgent center and then something catastrophic happens? That does happen, always will. Andre, you had yeah, your hand I, I'm raised. I'm taking exactly the concern that you have. Um, and just, you know, for a group of folks that this isn't their world, that's the complexity of the world that we're dealing with. Yep, yep. Andre? Yeah, and actually it goes up based on what Joe said before, it kind of leads into it. One of my customers has a, uh, in essence, a Fitbit for the breath, which is a digitized way of, of exercising and measuring breath. It's used for, uh, in essence, it's a digitized spirometer. Um, they've done clinical tests and showed tremendous compliance with children because they've gamified the use of the spirometer. Most children will use a spirometer because it's just a pain in the neck. Where here they've got video games for the kids to play and the study showed a 98% compliance. Anyway, based on what Joe asked is, so I have my customer and he's looking to get this product out there. Uh, this would certainly be a, a boon to people with COPD, people with asthma, or any other types of smoking or uh, breathing conditions, but, but it costs more than a $10 spirometer. So, so the question is, is that, you know, is there a way to, to who, how would somebody, this is an entrepreneur, it's a startup, yeah. and we've developed the product, it's done, it's working, we've manufactured it, is there a way or how would somebody either through you or else approach this marketplace? It's a, it's, it's a great, a great example. So it is a compelling, credible innovation for people with asthma, especially kids. And, you know, when you're looking at asthmatics, there's a huge population of children uh, in asthmatics. So love the idea. An employer wouldn't buy that per se. What I would advise that particular entrepreneur is, one is make it available to the overall pulmonology community, uh, work with the American College of, American Society of, et cetera. But whereas it's not a direct sell to employer, it could be part of a direct sell of a respiratory disease management approach. So it can be the intel inside, the cool factor, the bell or whistle that's part of our approach, which is digital health and digital medicine. Let's, let's take that. I have an approach where I contact all of your asthmatics. Um, you know, we have an app, they all have an app. We have people on the other line of a phone call, they just touch a button and they're talking to somebody about their asthma. They can do that just routinely. They can do that in terms of lifestyle. They can do that in terms of um, uh, et cetera. They may have uh, you know, a, 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 a peripheral or a lateral that they attach to their iPhone and it's actually a makeshift spirometry and we're seeing a whole proliferation of that. And they may also have Sorry, they may also have um, um, a network of, of pulmonologists and or they may use or be interested in modifying that device into something that's, uh, uh, that's, you know, I don't know if that device is, well, this has to be for a provider because the costs are significant enough. It wouldn't make sense for an individual with asthma to have it, but it would make sense for the pulmonologist to have it. No, it's, 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 a, relative, it's a relatively low cost. I mean, you're talking about a few hundred dollars. So I would you know, look to asthma disease management and pulmonary disease management and also think, this is actually a cool idea. I would, I, I, I'll talk to you, I'll find it to punt, but also think through, is it its device and software? Could the software be embedded in something else? And, um, uh, you know, is there something there that would really make it compelling? So if I have a, if I have a you know, a, a, a asthma tends to skew more urban than rural. It tends to skew more lower socioeconomic than upper uh, 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 socioeconomic. And it tends to be more problematic uh, right. in uh, kids and young adults. As an employer, if I'm an employer, 
<laughs> you know, with a thousand people in Detroit, thousand people in Philadelphia, um, um, you know, with you know, and I'm covering not just my employees but their spouses and children. I you know that that may be a big problem for me, and a solution like that absolutely could be part of a solution for employers. That's a great example. Well, I'd, I'd love to speak to you offline about it then. No, well, you guys are both members of Premium, so just chat one another. Oh, that's, that's good. It. Tell me your name again. Andre Domino. Okay. The Italian. The Italian one. Yeah. <laughs> you look like a barber. You look like every barber in Philadelphia. <laughs> John, did you want to oh, add something? Yeah. Wait, just as a side note, I cut my own hair, so. <laughs> oh, that explains it. <laughs> John, did you have something you wanted to add? Mr. Saul? No, no, no. I was just wondering uh, how well Andre sings. <laughs> it depends what you want sung. A little Dean Martin, maybe. <laughs> maybe, you know what? Your week's coming up in just two weeks. So maybe two weeks from today. Tune we'll in for Andre's song stylings. Ain't that a kick in the head, so. And uh, a week from today, we won't meet at 8 a.m. Pacific. We're going to meet at 1 a.m. Pacific. So I expect to see none of you. Instead, <laughs> I'm going to see a whole new crop of faces who live very far away from us. And I'm going to stay away because that's the, you know, I mean, I'm the kind of guy I am. That's right. That's, that's why I'm doing that. Well, um, I picked up a few things, but the, the biggest one is if I have a question in this, ask Ron. That's that's my big takeaway. And that's how I kind of keep myself together by just knowing people who know what they're talking about. So if employee benefit plans, then Ron. Yeah, it's a different world. Um, the questions were all right in there. The question about, um, you know, about pre-authorization and taking issue with the challenges is, I think it's important for all of us to really appreciate that on, on a couple of different levels. So that dynamic that I walk through, I think, gives a very interesting multi-stakeholder perspective on things. And then, you know, the examples, Joe, that you teed up with uh, uh, the web link that you sent, um, and then this uh, the, this pulmonary device uh, is, is, is uh, exactly where we're seeing the marketplace go. Um, if there are new technologies that are cost a little bit more, but really would make a difference in terms of compliance with treatment or diagnostics um, for a small population where it really makes sense, that's where a lot of the action is. Does anyone else have any topic related or un that they'd like to share this week? Well, I just wanted to say that um, I was at CES and um, oh, in Las Vegas, it was, great. A lot of fun to see all the digital technologies. Um, you know, everything is is exploding on the sensor side, especially in the area of breath. So, um, you know, talked to the guys from Lumen, from Israel, spoke with a lot of uh, good companies. Uh, they're one out of San Diego that's doing more of the chip technologies moving into literally Every product, every consumer product, uh, all the air filters, now people are being, uh, you know, demanding and saying, well, how, how is this air filter helping my air? Well, now they've got low cost, uh, very efficient chips to actually see the air quality um, improvements. And so um, we're, we're, we're seeing this move very, very, very swiftly into, into the consumer space. Um, and not to focus too much on breath, but th there was also uh, a lot of um, home innovation in terms of mirrors. So for children um, uh, brushing their teeth, they would get some animation on the mirror, like, oh, you've spent enough time in that quadrant, congratulations, and then move to the next quadrant. And I think, you know, the, we saw pills, uh, pill dispensaries, uh, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of consumer products. Um, the, it's just the space is expanding and expanding. And, um, and I think we're just going to see more and more great 
consumer innovation uh, on the cuff of the of the medical uh, space. In addition to all the digital support, AI um, that has been uh, shared uh, during the during the show, amazing off the shelf AI stuff where you basically give some basic parameters and and the machine learning is already there. Uh, starting to generate correlations. You don't need uh, a, a whole football field of programmers to do the work. You basically have uh, an automated uh, system to just you ask the questions and that's it. Uh, the only thing I'll add to that is, um, you know, all, all of that rings true with, with what I'm seeing. Some of the consumer solutions, so um, pediatric dental health, uh, you know, who's interested in that? You know, um, if I'm an employer and I'm in uh, an area where uh, there's a war for talent, where I'm, I'm having trouble hiring certain kind of talent, uh, these people have children, I'm offering them dental insurance, I can see Delta Dental, MetLife Dental, being really interested in having that, um, that game with kids be, uh, uh, be something that uh, they offer. Uh, uh, as part of their dental insurance, I can see that 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 same application relevant to a um, national network of dental providers. I can see that same thing, obviously, you know, being purchased by a Crest or a Colgate, etc., and being distributed that way. But there is an interest. For just remember, there's always an interest in. I'm an employer. You know, if I'm Home Depot and I have uh, 125,000 employees. Uh, and I'm covering 278,000 lives out there because I'm covering my employees, their spouses, and dependents. There are a lot of things that I'm interested in, and uh, you know, some of that might be making sure that your company is helping you take care of your kids. So a solution like that could make sense. Kids are a big motivator for corporations. I, I know from. You know, speaking with underwriters at the Disney Corporation, you know, companies with hundreds of thousands of employees, they, they are, that's, that's stickiness to the business. And it, sh it shows a level of care that um, equates, you know, at a factor of two or three compared to their caring for the employee. Hmm. Yeah. Joe, you'll love this. You know what Disney calls its, um, uh, its employees? I tell yes, you. I Cast members. Cast members. Right, right. Right. Yeah, there's a whole world out there in terms of, you know, I, I, I came at this more from the medical device, medical cost thing, but if you start getting into wellness and um, employee satisfaction and, and um, uh, employee lifestyle, and what am I getting from my employer if I'm cleaning at whatever that company is, there's a, there's a lot there as well. For my part, I had a terrible night's sleep. I'm taking a nap. <laughs> During the call, thank you for today, gentlemen, and uh, the occasional lady who popped on and off. Um, I'll see you online, and uh, we'll be here next week at 1 a.m. in the morning Pacific time. Thanks, everybody. Have a good weekend. Great weekend. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.